Hello and welcome to another episode of the Process and Automation Podcast with the Automation Guys. Usually you hear Arno, myself, talking about all things process and automation. But today we have uh, things a little bit different um, because today we have a great guest on the podcast who is as passionate about process and automation as we are. It is with great pleasure to welcome our next interview guest to our podcast. Um, he is the manager, public sector, UK and Ireland at Nintex. Um, yeah, hello, Paul. Thank you for joining Arno and myself today. Thanks very much for inviting me, Sasha, and, and hi, Arno. Thanks very much. Cool. Um, uh, yeah, please uh, tell us a bit more about um, you and what you're doing at Nintex. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, well, I, I've been at Nintex for a couple of years, but I came across uh, in 2020 as part of an acquisition of a company called K2, which uh, hopefully some of the listeners will be familiar mm. with as well. Um, in a way, K2 and Nintex were, were huge competitors <laughs> for 10 years, and, and then we joined together, uh, and uh, and it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Um, so combined, I would have been with, with the same company, if you like, continuous employment for about 13 years um, mm. at the end of December. Um, and I've worked across all kinds of sectors and countries. You, you're right, right now I'm doing the public sector in the UK and Ireland, uh, but before that I've worked uh, across all of Europe, you know, from Tel Aviv to, to Teddington. So um, before that, I worked for a company called Capita, who were a business process outsource company uh, in the UK, uh, mm. and then also a company called Tower Software, who are now called HP, in the field of documents and records management, EDRMS. So I've kind of been involved in process and automation and documents and so on for about 20 years. Wow, yeah, pretty much like Arno and myself. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I think Arno and um, uh, and myself working um yeah with with various intelligent automation vendors for more like more than 15 years and um with those vendors we support uh, companies with all things process and automation so with that background we have done that so and um where do you see um the sweet spot specifically now after your your experience with different companies um for nintex in the market yeah i think um I'm kind of, I count myself as really fortunate in that, you know, working for Nintex because it is a, um, an end to end automation platform. So it's not a just a, excuse the phrase, but a, a one trick pony, you know, a company that just does one thing. Um, Nintex has this whole raft of a suite of products, if you like, across workflow and forms, but then also, yeah, RPA and document generation and signatures and business intelligence and so on. So. Yeah, you know, we're, we're in a, a really good position, I think, right now. Um, of course, the world isn't perhaps in such a great position, but um, <laughs> we have to just get through that, you know. Um, mm. I, I'm covering public services and, you know, it's they've made it quite clear there's going to be cutbacks in that area. So, you know, what we're trying to do, uh, what I'm trying to do is just to, to help customers get going on the automation journey, which I think, We'll save them, I know, but we'll definitely save them time and save them money, which will enable them to do things in a better way. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's a good time, I think, to be involved because we're going to help people you know, get over the difficult times uh, and hopefully recover a bit quicker. Yeah, no, that is, um, that's quite topical, the automation and optimization, especially you touched a bit on the economic forecast and outlook for 2023. Um It, it looks quite scary out there. And I think that automation is certainly something specifically in public sector, I suppose, as well, um, that allows, um, you know, uh, organizations to to really, um, you know, cut, cut that unnecessary costs. And it sounds like, you know, with you at Nintex and obviously experience, Paul, um, you know, you know, you are exposed To, to quite a lot of use cases and the way that you can use Nintex to, you know, deploy automation solutions. Um, you know, just kind of thinking maybe um, back at, at, at the sort of things that, that you got involved with type of projects, um, you know, what um, do you think is the, the, the most um, exciting and impactful use cases um, that can be delivered or 
that was delivered on on the Nintex platform. I think our listeners um, are very interested in obviously uh, technology, automation technologies. Um, you've mentioned Nintex has got quite a a few capabilities with inside its platform. So it'd be nice to understand, you know, what what you think are those those great use cases uh, for the platform. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, I've just been so so lucky uh, in that I get to see quite a lot about you know, real applications, things that are used. It's one of the reasons why I'm passionate about public sector. A lot of people would say, oh, public sector, you know, isn't that a load of filling in forms and a lot of tenders and stuff mm-hmm. like that, you know, especially in, in sales like I am. But um, the actual use cases, what they do with our technology can be really interesting. Um, mm-hmm. And I've been very passionate about case management. Uh, you'll know, uh, I'll know that we used to work with a guy, Igor Yurisevich, and, and he... Mm-hmm developed using K2, you know, which is still a, a core part of, of the offering that Nintex have, uh, that yeah. on-premise um, is, is, is Nintex automation for on-premises, which was K25. And, and he developed the initial thinking around around case management. And that's where I've seen a huge amount of things that I, I thought were, were exciting, um, challenging, uh, <laughs> you know, some really yeah. tough stuff. So, uh, you know, something that's in the news right now was, um, again, working alongside uh, one of my previous employers, um, where, how they handled asylum applications and actually sure. moving people from the UK, you know, mm-hmm. putting them on planes to go to different places. Um, I worked on a project which was around the management of, of ankle bracelets for prisoners. Uh, right. Again, the kind of thing that you, you know, when you work for a process company, you don't expect to be involved in those kind of things. But but I did. And, and actually, there's another one I know that you know pretty well, uh, Arno, as well, which was around the contingency planning um, for a London hospital, just in right. case there was an EMP attack, you know, or yeah. something like that, you know, from from uh, from bad people. I did a firework display permissions for a fire brigade, crikey. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I mean, I've been really lucky. Again, I've spent time working with some of the, you know, the people like MI5, for instance. You know, it's, uh, you know, I, you watch a program like Spook, it probably hasn't been on for a few years in the UK now, but... And you get to see some of their capabilities that they they require to carry out their work, and mm-hmm. you see some of our technology spilling over into their world. Yeah. So, you know, it's of course it's really important for somebody to do their expense claim or their holiday request and whatever. That's that's workflow. That's that's automation. But I get the real buzz out of the stuff. You know, getting to go into a hospital and getting to what and see how our technology has has helped the patient journey around yeah. the hospital to be less paper yeah and make a big difference and and i think that you know um there is this sort of i don't speak for everybody but it's this sort of general consensus that automation is a private sector financial services that's mm-hmm. the that's the sweet spot you know we, we you know that, that's the place where it needs to be applied the most um, but I think that there are certainly very interesting opportunities with inside private sector. Um, some of the examples you've just used, um, you know, uh, if you look specifically inside the NHS, um, regardless if it's NHS back office, um, you know, optimization, fraud detection, things like that, anything to do with procurement, you know, to, to make budgets go further or patient care. So, so I think that public sector is actually quite an interesting place. Um, perhaps it needs more innovation and that's why mm-hmm. it's exciting to get involved with it because there's a lot of things, I guess, in the private sector that has got carryovers to public sector. And by the sounds of it, there there are a lot of opportunities and there's a lot of use cases, um, you know, and you've just t- touched on a few. I'm pretty sure, you know, that there are thousands of these. So, yeah, yeah, yeah thanks for that. No, how no, many use cases there are yeah yeah no, thanks sasha yeah I, I think it's you know it's it's something that you know and, and i you know without giving giving away you know secrets from nintex in terms of the direction of travel of where the company's going but it's you know we recognize that you know for an organization to build out some of these things they're going to need not not one piece you know not just rpa or not just workflow or electronic forms or digital signatures but they're going to need, need all of these things together mm. as one package. And um, Nintex changed its pricing uh, just a couple of months ago to kind of come up with a all-you-can-eat offer, you know, the, the the whole product stack, whatever you need. You know, you get it all for one, you know, in one go, one hit um, for the enterprise. And I think 
exactly as you were just saying, Arno, yes, that's going to be attractive to a, a bank or a financial services organisation, but it's also going to be attractive to the, the government body, which has to do lots of different things. And, and you know, of course, the citizen is always going to be front and centre for mm. much of the of the processes that are developed within public services. Uh, and again, I've seen some some great stuff in Malta and all kinds of countries across Europe, whereby you know, they're doing much more citizen interactive services mm. using technologies such as our own. It's not just about the back office and the automation of the back office. Yeah, office. yeah indeed. Yeah, so in Germany, where I uh, have lots of contacts there, so yeah, that, that there's a big big uh, program currently underway to do. Um, so they all collect basically over 285 of the the current services of local government, sort of into this uh, digital, bring bring it into, into digital really, and, and they, they struggle um, otherwise to really get going. But um, hopefully, a platform like Nintex um, can can support them. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. And. and... Nintex or, or or their technology of choice, you know. It's, it's yeah, uh, you of know, course. It's, uh, there's good technologies out there. You know, we're 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 one of them. I like to think we're the best, but but absolutely, we're not arrogant enough to think that we're the only choice in town. So uh, you know, as you say, as long as, as long as people get going on yeah. intelligent automation, mm. that's all that matters. You know, get yourself yeah, started. Indeed. Yeah. So yeah, in, intelligent automation, hyper automation. Uh, the, these are sort of the, the big buzzwords of the last years. Um, and uh, you're looking a bit into the the future 2023 maybe where do you see things developing for companies uh, in these areas yeah absolutely it's only about six weeks away you know 2023 oh yeah (laughs) (laughs) it's not that much into the future but (laughs) but you're right 2024 2025 and so on um and hyper automation is interesting i I wasn't sure if it was something a, a term that was phrased because Somebody said, oh, we need something a bit more than automation. Oh, let's go hyper automation. You know, and I know, you know, I know what it means. Um, but, you know, it's it, it kind of, you know, do we then get super hyper automation and platinum hyper automation? And <laughs> you know, my personal thing is it's all about, you know, people shouldn't rush to automate something just because we call it something different. It doesn't mean, oh, this is what we need to be doing. Um, you know, it. Some companies end up with a bit of business indigestion and, and they get, you know, I remember talking about workflow 10 years ago and, and companies would say, oh, yeah, we tried that. You know, we tried Tibco or whatever it was back in the day and it didn't work for us. It made employees do things the way they didn't want to do them. And and I think that's where things go go a bit wrong. You know, if you, if you hyper automate a bad process, <laughs> it, you're going to end up just doing the same thing quicker and, and with greater speed and at a greater cost. Um, so look, you know, start slowly, start simply. And, 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 and I think that's, you know, what I would like to see companies doing is perhaps just taking a little bit more time to think about what's right for them, get back to the basics, map out the processes, put the people at the front of what they're doing. And, you know, what is it? People, process and technology. Well, you know, people's at the beginning of that. So, you know, get people to come together and work out what's right for them. Um, for us, I think I think you know the big ones right now, and, and you, we've seen it with companies like Slowness and like Cryon, which is the company that that Nintex have, uh, have again recently taken over mm-hmm. and, and merged into our product set, which is around process mining, process discovery, task mining. Um, I think if you go onto the website, I, I passed it around my company this morning. Actually, I came across it uh, on LinkedIn, which was uh, the CIO.com website a piece by Johnson & Johnson, the big pharmaceutical company. And they were saying that they were aiming to save half a billion dollars through intelligent automation, right? $500 million, an amazing figure. And yet they said they're already over halfway there by implementing the right things with with intelligent automation. Um, But they did talk about how they initially struggled with it. Uh, And part of that was that the people didn't know their business processes as well as they thought they did. So they go to the head of customer services, let's say, please, I'm, I'm not quoting Johnson & Johnson there, but they go to the head of customer services and he'd say, oh, this is how we do it. And it turned out it wasn't perhaps exactly the way that they do things. So they employed a, a task mining tool, a process mining tool to do that. Uh, and then that not only uncovered that particular process, but 
uh, found a few more processes that they didn't even know existed. So mm. if you ask me where things are going, I think there's going to be a lot more demand and a lot more people interested in that front end of you know what actually is our process. Then you can mm-hmm. it's interesting. Yeah, mm. I, I think you've actually in a roundabout way answered my next question, which was you know what, what is your advice for companies that wants to get started with digital transformation projects and automation projects. And I think one thing that, that 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 kind of stood out, and maybe we can talk a bit about that, is to get started. So I mean what what is your sort of go-to advice that you, you know, if you or if you have to pick three things, you have to tell somebody that, you know, have a corridor conversation or maybe you met somebody at on an online event or at a physical event, you know, and they want to get started, you know, what what is your advice to them? So I have to be very careful. I oh, know you're not because I can't be controversial. Well, I can <laughs> a little bit. So look, look, you know, take it that this is my opinion, right? <laughs> but you know, first of all, yeah, don't rush in. I think that a lot of RPA, a lot of companies, it seems to me, over the last five years, have said, "Oh, we must get," and they they bought some robots from from a from a provider, and they've not really used them, and they've not really thought about how they're going to use them, and. It's given them a bit like workflow 10, 15 years ago. It's left people with a little bit of a bad taste in the mouth that maybe sure. this isn't this isn't right. And I I think they've they've rushed in. And you know, you've got to get back to the brass tacks and, and think about the mm. people and the processes before spending the money. You know what's really important? Get good advice from specialists, people that know what they're doing. And yes, you can go to the vendors, people like, you know, I've been doing this a long time. You can come and ask me. But, you know, there are specialist people out there, not from the big four, but people who actually are specializing in good automation advice. Like like automation guys, for example. (laughs) (laughs) Is that what you guys do? You never told me that. (laughs) Yeah, we, yeah, we, um, you know, we, 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 it it keeps us out of trouble and, um, but yeah, on a, a serious <laughs> note, I think that, uh, yes, I, I guess there's always a, a vendor-driven approach where the vendor will offer a different narrative to what a consultancy approach would be. Um, yes. So we pretty much on the consultancy side where we look at the landscape, we look at the goals you want to achieve. Um, we also look at, you know, the 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 size of and your appetite for 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 automation projects so if you have a very strategic project in mind and it it turns into a program of work that's the sort of thing that will give strategic advice if it's more of a tactical well we want to dip our toe into rpa or nintex workflow for example whatever that is you know that that's going to be a, a sort of a slightly different approach um so so i guess what you're saying is look at your processes, make sure that what you want to automate is is kind of clear and then overlay tech on top of that to understand what's the most effective way to actually go and automate things. So you don't end up with automating the wrong things mm. or, um, you know, creating um, automation projects which turns into novelty projects or worse worse even um having a great technology but having no application for it with inside your business 100 percent. it is on i was reading i doing some research and i was reading uh sasha's website and you know they it talked there about you know one of the things that, that sasha's company recommends which is to run a small scale pilot project first That's yeah great advice. Mm. you know that sasha that's exactly what people should be doing pick an easy process and a hard one and then, you know, get somebody to work with you to kind of say, okay, is this going to work or not? Where could we, what what would be the best things to use and so on? So, mm. so I think, Sasha, you know, you, you, you've already written a blog piece <laughs> on this, right? <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah, completely agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, you know, yeah, there's, you know, take your time, don't rush in, get good advice and, you know, pick some things that, you know, are the, are perhaps some, some easy wins, but things yeah. where you can learn, you know, uh, rather than yeah, let's let's go spend <laughs> loads of money on something. <laughs> you know, I want you to do that eventually, but I want you to get there through your own findings and the fact that yeah. you actually come to that realization. And, you know, we're in Gartner said about Nintex. You know that what's what's Nintex's strength, and as well as our technology, is the fact we've already got ten thousand customers, and so we've got ten thousand people using our technology 
who we've done exactly that with. They've started with one of the things that we do, and now we're able to talk to them about, let's go and do some more. Let's, let's yeah. grow. Let's use some of our other technologies. So, yeah, that's where we are. Cool. So, um, yeah, we and our listeners like to get to know our interview guests a bit more. So a bit more than just the technical and the business side. That's mm -hmm. why um, we like you to ask a couple of quick questions, which are really not technical and business related. Um, so are you up for it? <laughs> oh, man, where could this go? Um, yeah, yeah, go on then. Go on. All right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Who is your idol and why? You know, my wife's not listening, so it's okay. I don't have to say my wife. But though I do think she's absolutely amazing because, <laughs> you know, in our, in, our, in our job, we have to do loads of stuff uh, that's out of hours and traveling and suddenly plans change. You know, she's looking forward to a summer holiday one day. And, you know, it's <laughs> it's coming up to our 25th wedding anniversary. So I suppose I ought to, ought to take her somewhere. But... <laughs> I'm a, I'm a cricket person, right? That's my my sport. I love cricket. Uh, England just won the uh, mm -hmm. the T20 World Cup. Uh, yeah. This weekend just gone. So, um, uh, but I have a particular person called Jeffrey Boycott, who's um, a, a player from the 1970s and 1980s. Very single minded approach to what he did. Um, and when I first took up cricket, I got his book uh, and I read it, and that's what helped me to 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 do the same things as he did. You know, he he wasn't an entertainer. He studied hard, he listened, and then he put into that in all into practice. And so, yeah, people laugh at me for that. But anyway, that's my uh, that's my my hero is Jeffrey Boycott. <laughs> oh, cool. um, brilliant! Well, you just said a poignant thing there about being a good listener, and that that's such an important, I think, attribute for any human being to have is to be able to listen to somebody speak. Because I think everybody wants to be listened to. Um, so I guess if it's uh, uh, you know, if that comes through in the book, then I can see why this particular person is your idol. And you also have to listen to your wife as well. When she says you're going on holiday, she actually means she wants you on holiday this year with her there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're right. <laughs> so the top top court vacation these days. You That's... will be there, but <laughs> yeah. <Part two. laughs> Okay, um, so let's move it on slightly then. Um, so I've got a question for you, Paul. Yeah. Um, so imagine you can get all the contents and knowledge of a book instantly. Which book would you choose? Yeah. Okay, um, I, I do read a lot of books. I've got a lot of books on my shelves, but they're all mm -hmm. like science fiction and stuff like that. So I, I don't think it's any of those. Um, if I'm... You know what I, I would really like to be able to do, and it's something I can't do, is right mm -hmm. when when the techie guys get – I go to a meeting and then the techie guys get talking and I can't contribute because I haven't got a clue about developing code or anything like that. And I just love the way, you know, that they are able to switch from one thing to another. So I know it's a bit weird. Maybe, I don't know, is there a book like Developing Code book or in .NET or something or Java? I don't know. Something like that where I can instantly understand the technical conversation that these guys are having because I, I hugely admire what they're able to do, you know? Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Mm. So the next one uh, is, what's the best advice you have ever received? The best advice I've ever received? Um, <laughs> Wow. Okay. Um, I mean, it, when you're when you're in in a in a sales oriented role, you get loads of advice and loads of people saying stuff, and uh, you know, it, it's um, it's interesting actually. It was only something that I read last week on on LinkedIn again that uh, somebody was saying, look, if somebody asks you to talk, don't say, oh, you know, I'm, I I want to be paid for it. Just do it because at the end of the day, if pe people will listen, then and people will hear your opinions and what you've got to say. And maybe if they like it, then they might gravitate towards you and do something. So, you know, look, give of your time for free and, you know, and, and things work. You know, I do a lot of volunteering uh, in the community mm -hmm. and helping out with with kids, with sports and so on. And, and so I would say that just just, you know, if you've got time, then give it because you'll get back more in, in return than, than ever the giving of it. You know, that's that's what I would advise people to do. Yeah, amazing. 
Amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, and the last one for you, Paul, is if you could be an Olympic athlete, what sport would you choose? <laughs> is cricket in the in, in is it in there yet? In the Olympics, cricket? Uh, don't oh, don't, um, don't think maybe. so. That's, no. that's a tricky T20 question. Twenty would definitely will be next, I guess. Oh, okay. Okay. yeah. Um, Apart no, I, from T Twenty cricket, of course, because we know <laughs> you're the world's biggest England fan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think so. You do. I, I'm just. Uh, it's just something we were talking about. I know before we started, it was just uh, running. Uh, I know you're a, you're clearly a runner, Sasha, uh, and I took up running uh, in the last year or so, about the last eighteen months, and. Uh, so uh, I, I run 5K uh, every every Saturday morning, something called Park Run, uh, which I think is a worldwide. That's very good. Yeah. yeah, big in the UK. So perhaps the 5K, the 5,000 meters in the in, in the Olympics, maybe. <laughs> I won't finish first, but you know I'll give it a go. <laughs> so watch out, Mo Farah, right? So yeah. you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Olympics is about taking part, isn't it? Not necessarily winning, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'd definitely be, uh, yeah, I'd definitely be taking part, but I really enjoy it, you know, but it's something that I say only took up a, a little while back, and uh, yeah, it's been, it's inspirational to me, seeing all the people, you know, of all, you know, shapes and sizes and, and ages running around, and, you know, here, here's me doing my 5k, trying to beat somebody that's, you know, in the age group 70 to 80, you know, and, and he's ahead of me, right, so, you know, it's, uh, you know it is like, it is like playing squash against somebody that's a bit older than you, um, <laughs> I made that mistake once, and I, I will never do it again, oh, really? um, yes, <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting, I, I think the running, what we're seeing a lot, and obviously, Sasha, you, Paul, just touched on the fact that you, you do the, the runs for charity, and, mm. and, I think what's nice to see these days is all the the five kilometers park runs that happens across the country. Um, yeah. So it's usually every Saturday morning, and it's so great to be able to get out. And uh, there's a lot of um, popularity, um, kind of building, you know, for for these park runs. So it's yeah, it's definitely. I think running is one of those those activities that does it. Kind of gives you me time and just kind of like the fresh air and the time to clear your mind and you know and uh yeah it brings uh, the community together yeah also mm. yeah, it's very cool yeah. and it's free you know they people that do it there's always you know you volunteer it's it's you know, part, back to my best advice you know that people are giving up of their time to help other people i think it's mm. i think it's amazing uh, yeah, yeah. Good. Very nice, what, very what, nice that, one. Is to, that the end of the questions, or is there more? Well, no, there's not more. So that was very nice to end the show. <laughs> no more questions. And uh, uh, yeah, Paul, uh, maybe I have one question more. Actually, <laughs> um, how um, uh, can our listeners get in contact with you? Um, what would it, would be the best way? Yeah, I mean, so you know, of course, you know, we've got chatbots on our website and stuff like that. So if people go to nintex.com. Do a bit of research on there and have a look at the at the technologies that uh, that we've got in place already, um, and be very happy to to advise on on some of the things that we do. Though, you know, like I said, you know, they should get expert advice, you know, for independent expert advice as well on things. But yeah, just go to nintex.com, um, uh, or, or you could, you know, my email address paul.blackwell at nintex.com. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd be Absolutely delighted to hear from anybody if they or connect on on social as well, right? On LinkedIn potentially. LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn. Yeah, absolutely. I love cool. LinkedIn. Uh, mm-hmm. and, uh, that stuff. Yeah, like we'll that. Put, yeah. put all these infos in the in the show notes, and then uh, everyone who's listening can just um, click the link and get in touch. Oh, and really uh, cool. Um, yeah, thank thank you, Paul. Um, uh, it was great um, to have you on the show today. And um, yeah, maybe we do another one in the future if you if you like it. And then um, we will be back with another show very soon. And until then, let's automate it. Unfortunately, that's it again with this episode of the Process in Automation podcast. If you like this episode, please give us a five-star rating and don't forget to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss any upcoming episode. We hope you will tune in next time. And until then... Let's automate it.